my name is Irene Oldfather. Can I extend a very warm welcome to all of you to this afternoon's session from our Alliance Live gathering. Um, we're ending on what I think is going to be a very high note because I'm delighted this afternoon to be joined by Caroline Lamb. Um, Caroline is the new Chief Executive of NHS Scotland and Director General for Health and Social Care. So that's quite a long title, but good afternoon and welcome, yeah. Caroline. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks very much, Irene, and thanks for having me. So I guess, firstly, then, the obvious question is for people listening, Caroline, could you just say a little bit about that very long title and what those two and two roles entail and, and why you cover both of those? Thanks, Irene. Yeah, you, you, so you're right, it is a long title. Um, and you're right as well to identify that there's, there's a dual role in there. So, so the, the role of Director General for Health and Social Care covers the provision of advice on health and social care policy to ministers. Um, and then the, direct, the, sorry, the Chief Executive for NHS Scotland is very much about ensuring that, that, that delivery in what we're delivering, we're um, setting, paying attention to ministers' priorities in terms of how we're delivering across our health and care systems. Um, there, so it is a quite a unique role. And I think from my perspective, there are huge benefits um, from that dual nature because it offers the opportunity to ensure that the policy and the advice that we're giving to ministers about policy is grounded in reality and influenced by the experience of those working in health and social care and also receiving our services. Um, and at the same time, the implementation of that policy is, is, is set in a supportive context um, around policy that's been designed in a way that it can be implemented. So one of my key roles is to make sure that we keep those two bits joined up, policy and implementation. So, so that's very interesting. I'd like to come on and talk about policy and implementation in a minute. But just to say, you know, we've had a lot of interest in this session and lots of questions from our members and our member organisations. And really to thank everyone who's listening in today for helping to shape the agenda. And I suppose one of the things is around that sort of future planning and priorities. And I know what you're doing is advising, but could you just say a little bit about, you know, what, what you see in terms of, you know, going forward as um, that, that kind of crucial, uh, we're in a very difficult and challenging situation just now. How do you go about the planning and, and priorities around that? Yeah, you're right. We are in a very difficult and challenging situation. And in the, in the short term, I think we've got to make sure that we continue to focus on our response to the COVID pandemic because we're not out of that yet. So test and protect will remain an absolute key deliverable for us, as will the vaccinations programme. And it's great to see that we're, we're now over 1.2 million vaccinations. And so you know, it's great to see that, that rolling out. But at the same time, I think we need to keep an eye to the future um, and the future that I hope isn't too far away. So one of the things that I really want us to be able to do is to work together um, to build a vision for how we build back our health and care services, because this pandemic has created huge harm. Um, but it's also given us an opportunity to think differently. So, so for me, there are some key principles in amongst that. So I think we need to ensure that there's parity between mental and physical health services. Um, we need to focus on inequalities. Um, and on improvement and innovation and actually implementing the policies that we, we set out to implement. So looking at things like the Feely Report, the Independent Review of Adult Social Care, I really welcome that person-centred approach to this because for me, getting back is not going to be getting back to the old normal. We need to move to a new normal and that's absolutely got to place people at the heart of everything we do. And when I talk about people, I'm not just talking about service users, patients and service users. I'm also talking about our workforce because the workforce has been hugely stretched and under immense pressure for, for well over a year now, taking into account winter pressures from last year as well. And I'm really conscious that as we're talking to each other and to the, the public more generally about how we start to remobilize services, we need to pay attention to the fact that people need a rest and that there's a huge amount of untaken leave that's built up within the system because people have been doing their absolute best to continue to provide services. But they're going to need a chance to recover and recu recuperate from, from all of that. And I think we just need to be 
very open and honest about how fast we'll be able to move into getting everything back up to where we want it to be. One of the areas that we've been asked a lot about is the issue of chronic pain. And um, clearly the pandemic has hit people uh, who have chronic pain very, very hard indeed. Um, can you say anything about uh, going forward, how we make sure that this very vulnerable group is at the heart of re uh, mobilisation? Yeah, thanks, Irene. So um, I think, I think you know, we all accept that um, the, the, the pandemic has hit um, that group and, and some others as well, really, really hard, and that they absolutely need to be our priorities going forward. So we do have a team in Scottish Government that, that are working off our proposals on that. We, are, we all want to get back to a place where the services that we offer to chronic, uh, sufferers of chronic pain are, are accessible, available, fully supported as soon as we possibly can. I mean, I think you've mentioned some really important issues there. And, and, and I suppose, you know, for me working in the Alliance, the big ticket issues are things around um, Derek Feely's report and the Independent Social Care Review. And I guess also the work that we did around um, mobilisation and recovery. And in doing those pieces of work, we very much put people at the heart. So that, that ambition that you set out there about making sure that people are involved um, I think it was very clear to see in some of the key messages that came out of those reports that people were at the very heart of that work. So I guess it's how to make sure that on an ongoing basis, um, we don't do consultations with people and they tell us what they want, whilst recognising that there are challenges, but how do we make sure, how do we give them a structure and a process, a delivery mechanism around making sure that some of the things that they told us um, that we can actually action and some of them weren't I mean some of them were quite simple things I know when the mobilization recovery people were asking questions about um, you know how they could be equal partners in care how they could be consulted lots of the stuff that we've done today around realistic medicine making sure that that we don't lose sight of some of these really big ticket things and on social care that we put in place a system that people can look at and feel is fair yeah, so there's some really good points there, Irene. I think that we're not short of actually good and progressive legislation in this area. We're really not. What we're not so great at is actually making it real and making people feel like that's actually what they live and feel day, day to day. And, and, and I think the opportunity, again, you know, it's a pandemic. It has been awful. But there's also an opportunity out of that in terms of, of thinking again about how we do things. So for me, that's about people families, carers being involved as part of the development of a vision, as part of the decision making, as part of the planning and implementation of care. And, and key to that as well, I think, is being really clear what are the things that we value and how do we measure them? So how do we use our performance management system and to make sure that we're actually getting the outcomes that we, we set out to get? And how do we involve people in being part of that as well so that so that what we're measuring and what we're monitoring our health and care systems about is, is actually what people want. Yeah, I mean, I, I did an alliance live with Angelina Foster and the importance that she placed on collecting that data was very, very high. Do we have the systems in place just now to do that or is that part of the future planning? So I think we've got some of those systems, but we don't have all of them. Um, and so, so I think there are two things here, two aspects to what we need to do in our future planning. One is that we need to better join up the data that we all already have. And we've actually achieved quite a lot of that through the pandemic. I mean, organizations have come together to work around data in a way that you know, I, I don't think we would have thought was possible pre-pandemic. So that is one of the gains that we've made. So we need to join up better the data that we've got and derive some real insights from it but there's also data that we don't have or didn't have so when I say didn't have I think the work that's been done around the care home um, safety quality huddle has been fun fabulous in terms of starting to get real live data collected in a way that's not too onerous for for people but we need to do more of that we need to identify where we've got data gaps and we need to put in place really effective simple ways of gathering that data so that it feeds into our overall picture and you know if we just carry on measuring the things we've always measured we're not going to achieve this, the, the changes that we want to achieve. 
and often people say to us, you know, you measure things that, as you say, aren't important to us. Yeah. We want you to measure things that, that matter to our everyday lives. And I felt a very strong sense of that, actually, in the report we put forward on the mobilisation recovery work. Uh, absolutely. And I suppose one of the things the pandemic has done is, is accelerate in a way we could never have anticipated innovation. Um, you know, we may not have wanted it in that way. And I, I guess your role in terms of health and social care puts you in a, a unique place to look at this and evaluate it because, you know, we've talked about integration, we tried integration, but I think one of the things that the pandemic has definitely shown is, you know, how we can accelerate that pace when, when, when we try so hard to do it. And actually, the, often there are local level solutions involving, I might say, the third sector. Yeah. Um, that have brought a lot of this into focus and I, I don't know how you feel about that innovation side of things and, and you have any thoughts about how we make sure we hold on to that and any particular projects that you'd want to highlight? Yeah, I mean, there is no doubt that over the over the course of the last 12 months, we've moved mountains in many ways in, 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 in innovation um, and in, in implementing new ways of working, just as I was saying before, a pace that we've never seen before. And I don't think we thought was, was possible until we suddenly had to do it. And, and, and I think that the use of digital technology has been at the heart of that. Now, I'm never going to say it's only digital because there's, there's always going to be a very big role for face to face. But actually where people are able to get closer to services by using digital technologies or where people are able to better manage their own care and be supported in managing their own care using digital technologies, we absolutely should be embracing that. And I think we've done quite a lot of that through the pandemic, but there's still more to do. So we've built some foundations that we can continue to develop. The other thing that's really struck me has been how organisations have come together and being prepared to work together to, 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 to build technologies in a way that maybe in the past there was a bit too much being consciousness of organisational boundaries mm -hmm. rather than just what everybody can bring collectively. Um, and I think the, the infrastructure that has been built and is continuing to be developed around the vaccination programme, the COVID vaccination programme, is just a, you know, it's a, a hugely impressive example of that. Um, we didn't have very much in terms of digital technology supporting vaccination program before. They've always been a bit of the poor relative, but actually what we've done in terms of that, you know, the whole the, the scheduling system, the booking system, um, the, the portal that's going to be launched soon for people to self-register if they're, if they're unpaid carers, all of that um, has been developed by organisations working in collaboration and it leaves us a lasting legacy. So, you know, I can get a bit over excited about this stuff, but but I think just things like citizens owning their own vaccination record and being able to use that potentially for other purposes, it's hugely important. Um, and it starts to build for us that actual health record that, 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 that people have access to um, and control over. Uh, and the appointments booking will be extended to other appointments. Um, so so there's, a, there's a huge amount for us to, to build on there. So I guess I wouldn't want us to lose that um, enthusiasm to embrace technology driven by us needing to have less face-to-face, -face, but let's, let's make sure we, we, we carve out the time for face-to-face -face where that's absolutely appropriate, but that we use digital where we can. We need to do more work on um, digital exclusion. Um, so we have made steps in that direction, but we, it's not, we haven't done, done enough yet. Um, and overall, that collaboration, bringing the best of different organisations to work together to achieve a single aim has been, I think, you know, hugely inspirational, actually. And we definitely need to hang on to that. I mean, you mentioned digital exclusion there. And, and I was struck during some of our consultation around mobilisation recovery, actually how many older people, particularly in remote and rural communities, embraced, you know, where yeah. it was possible. <laughs> And for some carers, they actually said it was easier because they didn't have to leave the house to have a consultation. They didn't have to get on a bus. So, you know, I suppose there have been unintended consequences that we benefit from. But I can see on the other side, you know, there were a lot of comments around things like mental health where people said digital just isn't working. So I think that important point about face to face where we need it. Yeah, yeah, I, I, that's absolutely right. I think that. This is, this is about trying to make sure that those who want to and can access digital can do, that it's there, 
but that we absolutely there will be some areas where digital is always going to be less appropriate but equally we just need to make sure that people who do prefer face to face can get that one of the other, other areas that struck me as, as being innovative um, out with the digital climate was um, around transport. You know, I was amazed to see some work between the third sector, the ambulance uh, yeah. service, and, you know, some of the health boards around getting people to appointments, not just for vaccination, but for outpatient appointments. And, you know, we've talked about the patient transport service for years. And here, you know, as you say, in a matter of a few months, we've begun to get really creative solutions. And I think it's important that we, we find a place for that innovation going forward. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, another example I'd quote would be around the work to support people who are shielding and the delivery of food parcel, yeah. delivery of, of, of prescriptions, all of that that's, that's brought together health, health organisations, local authorities, third sector, volunteers in the community and the, you know, the willingness of people to come forward and, and support each other across our communities has been has been great to see as well and that's something else we need to hang on to people do want to make a difference and um, um, I guess so we've had a question to Caroline about about innovation and progress that was made before the pandemic on things like the person-centred agenda, um, realistic medicine, how people felt that they were moving towards being listened to and being at the heart of things. And suddenly the pandemic, it feels like it swept a lot of that away. And one of the issues uh, that's very regularly raised is around, for example, hospital visiting. I mean, we made huge progress in that and it took a long while and, you know, there were key actors in Scottish government and in the boards and, and Fiona McQueen was someone who you know very much led the charge on some of this. How do we make sure that that you know we don't lose some of that really good learning um that, that we actually had put in place before the pandemic? Yeah I, I think one of the one of the most um distressing and damaging things about this pandemic has been that um, the, the need to socially distance, the need to keep, you know, essentially we're very sociable creatures and the need to, the need to keep our distance and, and, and people not being able to, to visit, whether it be in hospital or in care homes. We absolutely need to get back to where we were and better. And I suppose for me, it's back to those principles. What sits at the heart of how we remobilize services has to be people and how we, how we get back to providing services that, that give people what they need um, and in, in that broadest sense, so it's not just about having your physical needs dealt with, it's also about your mental and your emotional needs and, and making sure that families and carers are able to support their loved ones. So that's hugely important as well. And I guess, you know, one of the areas that as an organisation um, we've been very active around is the whole what matters to you agenda. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, we're very hopeful that going forward we can continue to have a place for that. Because I guess if when we do ask people, and we did in, in the work around remobilisation, what matters to you, it is that human contact. And, and something that was raised with, with us was... Um, you know, are we too risk averse? It, it, yes, we understand we're in the middle of a pandemic, but for some people towards the ends of life, particularly around dementia and so on, you know, that human contact is absolutely uh, essential. So, you know, where is the risk? There is risk sometimes in, in not maintaining that human contact. And can we find some creative solutions? Um, I mean, as you know, people don't see themselves as visitors to care homes they see themselves as as integral to providing yeah. nutrition and support you know so how do we make sure that we don't lose that that human bit of what we do as carers and family members and and can we be creative around that yeah so I think I think everybody recognizes that that we need to be able to find ways in which we can get back to carers and families providing the sort of support um, to their loved ones that they were able to pre-pandemic and inevitably there is a risk involved but I think the approach that we need to take and we are there's, there's guidance being worked up at the moment the approach that we need to take is about making sure that we've got layers of barriers against those risks that mean that we are we are taking a risk-based approach so that we are balancing both the risks of 
um, somebody take care homes, people going into the care homes potentially with, with an infection against the risk of keeping those care homes sealed with all the damage that that, that, that causes. And it's about all the measures that we can put in place to mitigate that, that first risk. So we are very conscious of that. And um, I hope that we'll be able to issue new guidance on that very, very soon. And I guess it's been a bit of a learning process. You know, you learn as you go through this, um, how you move forward. That's absolutely it, Irene. I don't think, you know, none of us, none of us were experts in any of this um, when, when COVID-19 appeared on our doorstep. And, and we've, been, we've been learning and adapting to the science and to the research and, 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 and very much just trying to stay one step ahead in terms of the things that, things that we're doing and how, how we respond. But it's enormously challenging for, for our clinicians who provide us with that advice as much as anybody else. So Caroline, you mentioned earlier the vaccination programme and, and you and I have both sat on the board mm -hmm. and I, I guess we're all very proud of you know, the milestone of over a million people. It's been absolutely fantastic in the way in which we've, we've scaled all of that up and I know you've had a, a major part in a lot of the uh, planning around that. We've had some questions from some of our member organisations about um, individual groups and in particular, for example, people with learning disabilities feeling a little bit left behind in the pandemic because you know we know that the vaccination program is about protecting the vulnerable but people with learning disabilities are vulnerable and um, you know is there anything you want to tell us about how we move forward in that area? So I, I absolutely understand the, con the concerns of people. Um, I, I think what, what we have tried to do is to ensure that the rollout of our vaccination program is absolutely aligned with the JCVI, the Joint Committee on Vaccinations and Immunisations Advice. Um, and the JCVI themselves have looked at a huge amount of data, but they get, they're also looking at and, and assessing new data all the time. Um, and I suppose our commitment there is that the JCBI's initial advice was absolutely that the, the, the highest risk factor was age. Um, and so, as you know, we've been working through um, a, a process that uh, care homes fell into that as well. You know, care homes for the elderly people were absolutely at the top of our, our list of priorities and the JCBI's list of priorities. So we've been very careful to try to stick with the JCBI um, advice and guidance as that external source um, of information, um, but as they start to look at broader base of, of, of evidence, and as I've said before, we are learning about this all the time, and we also don't expect this to be a one-off exercise. So we, you know, we are absolutely mindful that it is likely that come the autumn, maybe we will need be needing to start with a, a, a program of booster vaccinations, and and as we learn and as we get more research, then we are obviously feeding all that in into uh, in, into how we would plan those programs going forwards as well. So I think that legacy planning is very important and you know recognizing that maybe there is more information coming through, more research that that throws a, a light on people with, for example, learning disabilities. And I guess also in terms of that legacy planning, our carer organizations have been asking, you know, would it not make sense when someone who's in that vulnerable elderly group gets vaccinated, but the principal carer is if, if it's a home vaccination or even a GP surgery vaccination, that the principal carer accompanies them and, and gets a vaccination too, you know, because if the carer gets COVID and goes into hospital, it creates a huge problem and makes the person uh, that they're taking care of much more vulnerable as well. And I don't know if moving forward, that's something that could be taken into consideration. It's certainly something being highlighted by carer organisations. Yeah, I think that's, a, again, that's an important point and definitely something that we will take account of going forward. We're learning from this. We were never going to get this vaccination programme right first time round. It's been a, a huge logistical exercise to get to scale it up. I'm very proud of what's been achieved, but that doesn't mean that we can't learn and we can't improve as we go forwards. You mentioned the patient portal. And, you know, again, one of the criticisms has been accessing information if you haven't had a letter. Um, when's the patient portal likely to open? Because I think that idea of the patients themselves, people themselves, you know, having ownership of their vaccination, their vaccination program is, is amazing. Um, what's the sort of time frame around that? How do you see that rolling out? 
Caroline. So, 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 so as you'll know, Irene, the, the, and as I said earlier, um, we've had to scale up and build a whole load of the digital infrastructure that underpins this from scratch. Um, so our first priority was to get to the point where we could start to um, automatically schedule people into, into clinics just because of the scale of the numbers that we're working with here. So um, we, are, I, we, we are on target for all our mainland health boards to be on the system for this week. And that means that we will have for the first time that overview of an, in the mainland boards of, of um, when people's vaccinations are planned. And that's really important in terms of people being able to easily find out if they if they think that they should have had an appointment but they haven't they can easily find out whether in fact they have already had an appointment sent and when it is and it's just somehow gone gone missing or if there are any glitches because there are you know we've got instances of people who've maybe moved to stay with relatives but their gp records aren't as up to date as they as, as they could be we've got inc we've got incidences of, of of maybe the chi records being a bit out of date as well so we can't pretend that this is perfect, um, but there the will, the, the will be glitches. So um, from this week that we've got all the, the boards onto that, the next stage in the rollout of that. So we've already got once, once you're bought, the health board you live in is on the system. That means that if you get an appointment, but you can't make it, you can go online to reschedule it, or you can call a phone number and they'll be able to help you with that. Um, the next stage of that is going to be for people to be able to access that, to start to book their own appointments. Um, and importantly, because we're we're moving into um, group six, which in, includes unpaid carers. So we know that we can identify some unpaid carers if they're in receipt of the carers allowance, but that doesn't by any means cover all of them. So there's a, a, a self-registration process being set up that will enable people who are unpaid carers who we might not know about to be able to, to, to register themselves. Um, I was told not to give any timescales on this, but I am hoping that will be available within the next few weeks. OK, thanks very much. I mean, I think that's very, very useful information for our members to know about. And as soon as we have any details about that, we'd be happy to, to support you in disseminating and promoting that information. Because we do hear of people in their 70s who haven't had a letter and, you know, it could have gone missing in the post. And, and the kind of advice at the minute is we'll, we'll wait and see. Um, and, and they could be a no-show because their letter's gone missing in the post. So it's making sure that we, we have a system in place to pick all of that up, you know, notwithstanding the, the, you know, the amazing progress that's been made in a very, very short time scale. Um, so we're, we're getting close to the end of our time, but I guess mental health is really, really important. And particularly, you know, you mentioned at the beginning, the staff. Um, I think in Scotland, we hugely value our NHS, and I suppose never more so than in this pandemic, our NHS, our, our ambulance staff, um, our emergency services. Um, and I know that it has been very challenging for people working very long hours. I mean, how do you keep well in this time? And do you have any advice for our NHS workforce or any key messages you'd like to give them, Caroline? So I think for, for, our, for our NHS and social care workforce, I'd say a huge thank you. I know that people have gone above and beyond, um, that people have sacrificed a huge amount personally and professionally in terms of keeping going over the last 12 months. And, and that has been in the context of, you know, all of us being impacted by the same concerns about, you know, about our own families and, and, and their welfare, particularly when you live at a distance from people. Um, I, I would also say that you know, I am really concerned about staff well-being which is why I was making the points earlier about being really clear that people need a break. They need some time to recover. We can't just go gung ho at remobilizing services. And I'd also say, I think there's a message of hope in there as well, that part of thinking about a vision for health and social care services going forward and that person-centered approach is about, this is our opportunity. We've got a moment here in which we can start to craft something that will be different uh, and that will build on what we've done so well in the past, but carry on that and, 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 and be, be you know, really, really about supporting people in the lives that they want to lead um, going forwards. For myself, you know, I'm, I'm passionate about this work and most of the time that's what keeps me going. However, I do also try, I try to get out for walks. Um, I have a dog, um, so that's helpful in terms of getting me, get, getting me out. And, and, and I think it's just, you know, be kind to yourself. This is really tough. 
Um, and we're all going to have days when we're not feeling that great. Um, and, and that's OK. Um, and talk to people, talk to your friends. There are lots of resources that are available um, in, in some of the hubs we've set up. So take advantage of those um, because this is tough um, and we do need to look after ourselves to get through, get through it. I've noticed some of your photographs on Twitter and I think actually for other people it's encouraging when we see, I know our chief executive Ian Welsh posts a lot and it's encouraging to see people kind of take you out there into the countryside on a day when you're sitting in Zoom meetings so it's lovely to see that and thanks for that, that uh, message. So I, I guess just in closing, what, what do you see? Firstly, congratulations, the first woman ever to hold this position. So we're all very pleased about that. Um, quite big shoes to follow. And, and, you know, I think about Derek Feely and I guess Derek was very much, you know, driving improvement. I, I think everybody's kind of brought a different a different thing to the job. And, and Paul Gray is very much that compassionate person into listening and kindness and, and Malcolm, a very safe pair of hands. What do you see? What would you like to be your legacy, Caroline? What would you like to, to leave us to think about you um, as, as a director general? I'd like to try and combine the best of those qualities from, you know, the people who've gone before me who, you know, who've all been hugely influential and, and, and successful in their, in their own rights. I think for me as well, at the heart of this, it is about putting people at the middle and it's, and it's about tackling inequalities. And as part of that, I think there's also something about how health and social care contribute more broadly towards employment, poverty, because we are huge employers and we're also huge spenders. We spend a lot of money and we have a pretty big fo carbon footprint. So I think if we can think about our contribution, not just in the direct contribution that we make towards um, health and, and well-being, but also starting to think about how we can use um, the way in which we employ people, where the communities that we target for, to, 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 to bring people into employment, the way in which we spend our money and the way in which we use our buildings and, and, and our transport routes and everything else, then we have also got the opportunity to make a far broader contribution to the well-being of the people of Scotland. And um, that's my mission. Thanks very much, Caroline, and, and, and very good luck from all of us with that. Um, Thank you. So thank you very much, Caroline Lamb. And to all of our listeners this afternoon, thank you so much for joining us this, our last session um, in our Alliance Digital Gathering Week. Um, I hope you have a lovely weekend and stay safe.